Welcome back to the class. Uh, in this session, uh, we will be discussing about uh, Herbert Spencer, a very important uh, British uh, philosopher uh, who has uh, tremendously contributed for the uh, formation of uh, sociology as a discipline. Uh, hope you remember in the previous class we uh, discussed uh, the contributions of August Comte, widely considered as the father of sociology. So August Comte had a very significant impact on Herbert uh, Spencer's thinking. Uh, because many of his arguments were influenced. Herbert Spencer was uh, born in Derby in England uh, in 1820. And uh, it's very uh, interesting thing to note that he did not uh, receive any formal uh, education. He was educated by his uh, father and his uncle. But uh, he turned out to be one of the very influential and uh, widely popular philosophers of his uh, time. And uh, he has written extensively and his uh, academic interest spread across different uh, areas. So it's, it's, uh, many, it's been widely uh, you know, considered as a very surprising fact that a person who did not uh, receive any formal education or who did not attend any college or university became so influential and became a very prolific uh, author and uh, uh, thinker. So he uh, viewed himself as a philosopher who can propose a grand project for uniting ethics, natural science and social science. This great project was termed as synthetic philosophy. And as we have seen in the previous uh, uh, classes as well, thinkers like Montesquieu or thinkers like uh, Saint Simon or even uh, to a large extent even August Comte, they were all preoccupied with the possibility of providing a much larger social law, a, a kind of a, a larger a social law that can be applicable across the globe, across societies, across the time because they were heavily influenced by the way in which natural sciences, physics, chemistry and biology were taking shape. And here uh, Spencer was no different. He wanted or he proposed to uh, formulate a theory uh, which uh, unites ethics, natural science and social sciences. And you must be by now knowing that this was too much an ambitious project a project which is uh, too grandiose in its nature and he termed it as kind of synthetic philosophy, a, a very broad, very overarching kind of a philosophy that uh, includes almost every aspect of human uh, as well as natural uh, uh, society. So his ideas became controversial later and lost their popularity after his death and we will come back to his uh, this particular point later uh, because uh, many of his arguments uh, that he made toward the end of his life, especially uh, related to uh, say the, the, the whole idea of social Darwinism, uh, which uh, put so much of criticism on, on him. He was thoroughly criticized by a whole lot of people for his, some of his very controversial and very conservative uh, arguments. So uh, he was very uh, heavily influenced by uh, theorists like Malthus, Von Bayer and uh, Charles Darwin. Uh, these theorists, especially uh, for example Malthusian's uh, theory about population growth and uh, Charles Darwin's theory about uh, this natural selection and evolution, these theories very, very significantly influenced uh, uh, Herbert Spencer's thinking because he always wanted to find a parallel between the human society and the organic uh, society, human society and the animal society or the, or, or, or the, or the organic society. So that theme actually runs through. Uh, his entire uh, scholarship or his entire academic uh, career. So Spencer came to emphasize that evolution is a process of development from an incoherent, undifferentiated and homogeneous mass to a differentiated and coherent pattern in which the functions of structure as are well coordinated. And this is a very uh, important uh, uh, and, and very interesting definition of, of evolution. And uh, you will be able to see that this understanding of evolution or this particular characterization of evolution can be applicable to both uh, natural society as well as human society. And exactly uh, Herbert Spencer argued uh, like that. So he argued, he, he provided a definition that evolution is a process of development from an incoherent, undifferentiated and homogeneous mass. So you have in, in, from a very simple uh, situation, from a very uh, incoherent, undifferentiated, simpler and homogeneous mass uh, to a differentiated and coherent pattern in which the functions of structures are well coordinated. So here you come across these two terms, functions as well as structures. 
and these two terms are extremely important because they laid foundation for the later development of structural functionalism as a very important theoretical school. I have made this uh, uh, remark um, several times in the previous classes, but this is an extremely important point that the whole uh, preoccupation with the question of, of, of the structure of a society and the kind of a corresponding function, how certain functions are performed or how it is imperative that certain uh, structures are uh, so important, so significant for performing certain kind of function, the kind of a connection between function and structure. This became one of the most uh, uh, important uh, talking points or important uh, point of theoretical reflection among the scholars of this particular time. So, uh, Herbert Spencer was uh, heavily influenced by this, uh, uh, this, this Herbert Spencer was heavily influenced uh, by this uh, theme of structure and function and he uh, found that the, 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 the natural evolution or the evolution of the species as articulated by Charles Darwin as something very fascinating where he can adopt and borrow these ideas into that of human uh, society. So, uh, Social Statics is the name of his book and uh, uh, in this book considered to be a very important uh, uh, you know, contribution of uh, uh, Herbert Spencer. Uh, he argues that uh, human happiness can be achieved only when individuals can satisfy their needs and desires without infringing on the rights of others to do the same. So, a, a, a natural understanding of uh, uh, you know utilitarian understanding of uh, human uh, needs and, and how human needs to have a certain kind of boundaries, how everybody has these similar kind of needs and how all of them have to have certain kind of understanding and restriction so that as a, as a collectivity they will be able to uh, pursue their uh, needs and uh, uh, presented this as a law of ethics and morality. Uh, so, uh, he has been later uh, been criticized heavily for taking up a very laissez-faire uh, kind of uh, position where uh, he, he argued that people has to be completely free. So, this uh, forms the basis of a, a law that he wanted to combine both uh, uh, ethics and morality. And also I mentioned in the previous class this term a law of ethics or a law of morality now looks quite problematic because no social scientist at present would use the term law to, uh, to describe anything uh, related to the social. You do not have a social law uh, as, as, as a law uh, similar to a law that is there in physics or chemistry, but uh, during Spencer's time this was the, the norm or most of the philosophers during his time uh, envisaged uh, formulating a set of laws that would be applicable to uh, society the way natural laws are applicable to the natural world. So, in this book uh, Social Statics, he sought to discover invariant laws and principles of social organization. They, they believed in that there are invariant laws, there are very, very immutable laws uh, and principles that govern social organization and secondly he began to engage in organismic uh, analogizing, drawing comparison between the structure of individual organism and that of society. And this is again a very important term that we came across uh, in when we discussed uh, August Comte and uh, a term which was given so much of attention and so much of theorization by Herbert Spencer. He has a very detailed analysis of organismic analogy where he makes a comparison between uh, the structure and function of a living individual organism and that of a society. So, he believed that there are parallels, there are similarities as well as there are differences between the way an individual organism function as well as a society function. And uh, we will just touch upon some of these observations later, but I am not going into the details. Uh, the, those who are interested can read uh, material on that. He makes a list of similarities between a living organism and that of society, also a set of differences. But these arguments have kind of lost its significance, so I am not really spending much uh, time on that. But this particular uh, line of thinking that comparing human society with that of a living organism, which is known as organismic analogy, was a very important foundational concept that laid the foundation for the emergence of structural functionalism. So, structural functionalism as we have seen that emerged uh, in the writings of August Comte developed through uh, uh, Herbert Spencer and later developed in a more sophisticated manner by Emil Durkheim later had its uh, you know growth and development in, 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 in uh, anthropology, in social anthropology and of course, later in, in, 
in uh, American uh, sociology uh, championed by uh, say Talcott uh, Parsons and, and by 1960s this particular uh, uh, theoretical foundation or theoretical orientation loses its uh, significance. So in his book uh, Social Status again uh, also reveals the beginning of Spencer's functionalism as we just mentioned. He viewed societies like individuals as having uh, survival needs with specialized organs emerging and persisting to meet these needs. So the basic uh, question that people like Spencer argued during that particular time, uh, how do societies survive? What are the basic needs of a society? For example, uh, uh, how is a particular society uh, finding the kind of an economic resources for its survival? How is a society uh, devising a specific mechanism to govern itself? How is a society evolving very specific set of morals and ethics so that there is some kind of a, a semblance of acceptance among each and every member of that particular society. So he identified each of these things as certain kind of survival needs, certain kind of functional needs and, and when you come to uh, Durkheim and later uh, functionalist, this becomes more complicated kind of set of questions about functional needs, about functional prerequisites but Spencer was one of the most important an influential thinker who, who began elaborating that, who began theorizing these things and also connecting with this survival needs or functional needs with specialized organs emerging and persisting to meet these needs. So what are the kind of a mechanisms that are at the disposal of a society to meet these uh, kind of a needs? So what are the kind of specific organs, what are the kind of specialized uh, say social forms of organization or, or parts of social structure that are capable of meeting these uh, social, uh, meeting these needs which are very important for every uh, society. Uh, in his book uh, Principles of uh, Sociology, uh, employing the organismic analogy that is comparing organic uh, bodily and superorganic societal organization, Spencer developed a perspective for analyzing the structure, function and transformation of societal phenomena. The same point that we have uh, discussed so far. Uh, he talks about the comparison between the organic and the superorganic. He calls the society as the superorganic entity and there are uh, similarities, there are parallels and he developed a perspective for analyzing the structure, function and transformation of social uh, phenomena. So when you talk about the structure and function, it talks about its, its, its existence, its social statics not social dynamics uh, as uh, Comte uh, uh, made, made a kind of uh, distinction. So on the one hand you are concerned about how each and every society is structured and how does it uh, uh, take care of its own needs and necessities and second major concern is that how do, these, how do these societies transform, how do these societies undergo uh, significant changes. So he wanted to develop a perspective that is capable of addressing both these, uh, both these dimensions uh, simultaneously. And he has a list of similarities and differences and uh, as I mentioned earlier, I am not going into the details. Uh, they, they, they look at how, you know, how there, is a, there are similarities between individual organism and the society and as well as differences. And in his um, another book, The Study of Sociology, he, uh, so this book elaborates his, his uh, uh, focused uh, thinking about developing sociology as a distinct social science. He accepted uh, uh, Combs uh, idea or Combs argument that this new discipline must be uh, named as sociology not as uh, social physics uh, and it has to be recognized or acknowledged as a, a science of the modern uh, time, so, so science of a modern society. So the goal of the sociology must be uh, to uncover the principles of morphology and physiology of all organic forms including the superorganic society with due care to its historic specificity. So he defined or he visualized or he envisaged sociology as a discipline that is uh, uh, you know aimed at uh, that which, which wants to uncover the principles of morphology and its physiology of all organic forms including that of superorganic forms and you know that how uh, these terms, this, this medical terms or this uh, biological terms uh, influenced Spencer's thinking and the only caveat or only uh, you know important caveat he added was that 
they have to be located within its uh, larger historical specificity because uh, human societies have a history and you need to have that kind of a historical understanding. You need to have that kind of a historical uh, perspective to make sense of this uh, physiology as well as uh, morphology. But uh, the thinking was heavily influenced by biology, thinking was heavily influenced by uh, you know his, his preoccupation with this uh, medical and, and biological terms. Now, employing organismic analogy, that is comparing organic, bodily and superorganic societal organization, Spencer developed a perspective for analyzing the structure, uh, function and transformation of societal phenomena. So, uh, exactly the same point uh, that we have been discussing, he wanted to analyze the structure, the function, how a society is situated and what, and, and what are its uh, constituent parts how a particular society is distinct and different from other society, how different parts of a society are brought together, what is the kind of a structure and what are the kind of a corresponding function. So, you, it, was, it, was, it was very uh, specifically argued that you cannot have, you cannot get a function performed uh, on, a, on a sustainable manner without having a, a particular structure in place. So, uh, Usually, how do we understand the term uh, structure? Structure is, is, is usually defined in sociology as an ordered arrangement of parts. It consists of different parts, but these parts are not, uh, you know, put together in a, in a, in a, in a, in a uh, casual manner. These parts are organized, they are arranged in a systematic, in a specific manner. Ordered arrangement of parts is, 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 the, is one of the usual definitions of the term structure. So, Spencer and most of the philosophers of his time and of course later philosophers as well including uh, anthropologists, British anthropologists wanted to understand how a society is structured, what are the specific ways in which a society is constituted, its economic, social and, and political and moral and religious elements put together and how this particular structure gives rise to certain kind of function and how there is a kind of a correspondence and also how the kind of a transformation of social phenomena. So, uh, he develops a model of restructuring social systems. In this model, uh, the basic processes are uh, forces causing growth in a system size, the differentiation of units, the processes whereby differentiation, differentiated units become integrated and the creation of a coherent heterogeneity, which increases the level of adaptation to the environment. So, uh, you can see that this is clearly what he means by the term evolution as explained uh, by uh, Charles uh, Darwin. So, in if you go back to the definition that uh, Herbert Spencer provided some time back from a very uh, incoherent, undifferentiated, uh, simple entity, the society moves into a more uh, coherent and differentiated one. So, here he says that it in order to do that, there must be growth in system size if he is talking about population, the population must uh, increase in its size, it should grow in its size and then there must be a differentiation of units. What does it mean the differentiation of units? You need to have more division of labor. We will come back to this point when we discuss uh, Durkheim. Durkheim's uh, argument about division of labor is, 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 a, is a very insightful argument about how societies become more and more developed. So, you need to have differentiation of units. In a society, you need to have specialized people or specialized institutions to take care of different things. For example, in, uh, in traditional tribal societies, it is the most undifferentiated society. You do not have too many differentiated things. For example, uh, education, there is no formal education thing. There may not be any formal uh, religious thing. There is no formal law enforcement agency. There is no formal you know, agency to produce things. Okay. So, each and everything is taken care, everything is, is handled by the same community. Whereas, in an in a, in a industrial society, in a society like ours, you have so much of differentiated functions, so much of differentiated agencies doing that about uh, entertainment, about transportation, about law enforcement, about, about justice delivery, about governance, about political systems. You, we know that how complicated a world that we are living in and the creation of a coherent heterogeneity. So, the most important point is that this heterogeneity is not orderless. This heterogeneity is, 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 the, is, is not something which is uh, very uh, uh, ambiguous. Okay. This heterogeneity has a very 
specific coherence. It is ordered, it is systematic. It is a very complicated process, it is a very complicated situation, complicated heterogeneity, but this heterogeneity has a coherence, it has a, it has an underlying unity and which increases the level of adaptation to the environment. So, when the society become more and more uh, complicated with a kind of a coherence, it, it develops its ability to adapt to the environment better. So, that is the argument that uh, uh, you know Spencer is putting forward when he talks about the evolution of society. Now, what is this, what do we mean by this adaptation? He specifically argues that this adaptation uh, into social change, the, he, he talks about uh, three types of uh, uh, society, primary, secondary and tertiary compounding by which he meant that a society has undergone a qualitative shift in the level of differentiation from a simple to a more complex form. Again, uh, a typical uh, you know unilinear evolutionary model from a uh, primary and a secondary and a tertiary society. What is happening uh, is that from primary to secondary and to tertiary, the compounding, the complexity is increasing and complexity in terms of society, we understand it as a, a kind of a level of differentiation. A primary society, as I just uh, mentioned a bit earlier, a primary society could be equated with a tribal society, a, a society which has not, uh, you know, developed or, or or progressed in the conventional understanding of the term. Is a, a hunting and gathering society, a hunting and gathering society that is the least differentiated society, and from there you have, uh, you know, secondary. Uh, compound society and the tertiary compound society. A tertiary compound society for a Spencer could be uh, the a society in which he lived where the differentiation have become too much. And uh, he also contrasted between militant and industrial structures, uh, two categories that he made. Militant structures are geared for aggression with strong central and coercive control of the individuals in a society. Industrial structures, however, are geared for peace. Uh, so, industrial societies, societies in which industrial structures predominate, have been described as having a spontaneously generated, uh, as having a spontaneously generated and loosely coupled mode of societal organization. So, as per his uh, classification, the militant societies are more characterized by aggression, whereas industrial societies are characterized by peace. And industrial societies uh, are having a spontaneously generated and loosely coupled mode of societal organization. These societal organizations are more organic, they are more differentiated, they are more complex, but something actually holds these societies together. And uh, now, coming back to a kind of a critical uh, evaluation of uh, Spencer, uh, see, Spencer is the one who coined the term survival of the fittest, uh, which uh, became heavily influential in the, in the discussions on um, evolution. We, we are all familiar with the term uh, struggle for existence and survival of the fittest and uh, which presents you uh, with a very brutal character of the, uh, of, of the nature where different species uh, fight for each other, they, they struggle for their existence and through a process of natural selection, only the fittest. Uh, remain all the unfit uh, species they disappear and this is how uh, one of the interpretations of this uh, organic evolution evolution of, of species has been elaborated and here it's very interesting to see that spencer adopts the similar uh, argument to uh, society and uh, it can be seen as a very very uh, cruel or insensitive argument that uh, human beings are like uh, different uh, animals or species who are struggling for their existence and only the survival, only the fittest will survive and he is the one who coined the term. So, uh, this uh, uh, idea that he developed that uh, certain societies are more fitter and thereby they, they deserve to, uh, to, 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 uh, to live in the society, they deserve to uh, flourish whereas the less fit societies, less capable societies are fit to disappear. And uh, this idea was very much, uh, you know, used by many of these uh, conservative philosophers during his time. And uh, you also must remember the context in which he is making this, these statements. These statements are made when 
uh, Europe was at the at the at the at the uh, at, at the peak of its uh, colonial expansion, and colonialism is one of the most violent episodes in human history. You know that the people who were the a, a couple of uh, four or five major European uh, powers, military powers, they travel across the globe and they identify people who are uh, less uh, you know fit. Uh, or, or, or less capable than them in terms of weapons and in, in terms of military prowess and then dominate them, kill them systematically, wipe out entire population and then conquer their place. So this colonial expansion or, or outright form of, of uh, domination, violent domination which was you know justified on the base of race, which was justified on the base of religion uh, because uh, for, for most of these uh, colonial uh, uh, conquerors. Uh, people who do not believe in Christianity were not even considered as, as, as human beings. So there was nothing sinful, there was nothing wrong in killing people because you are not killing the true uh, human beings. A true human being is somebody uh, who, 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 who practices Christianity. So if you see a savage for example, if you see somebody who, who follows some other kind of uh, religion, there is nothing morally wrong or religiously wrong in killing them. So in such a political climate where this form of naked aggression and naked dominance was the practice, okay, Spencer became a very important uh, scholar whose arguments could be used to justify this kind of aggression and dominance because he is talking about a society, a, a law where the, there is only the fittest survives and the, let, the, the, the less capable people, less capable societies must give way for a more fitter, more capable, more stronger society. So this term which became very uh, famous or infamous as social Darwinism uh, became very uh, prominent during his time and uh, 1920s, 1930s it became very, very heated debate, it uh, led to heated debate and became a very controversial term. A social theory that applies the law of survival of the fittest society and integrally related to the 19th century rise in scientific racism. So you must be knowing that the, the rise of uh, scientific racism where uh, biology was used, evolution was used, uh, you know, physical anthropology was used to categorize people into, uh, into several races by, by using all kinds of scientific principles, by uh, arguing that people can be divided into watertight compartments, which people can be divided into very distinct forms of racial types by uh, you know measuring the, by, by looking at the skin color, by measuring the texture of the hair, by measuring the, 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 the skull, something called as a cephalic index, by measuring the nose uh, known as this uh, nasal index and a number of other indices, they uh, prepared very scientifically looking, very convincing, very rigorous uh, classificatory schemes where uh, people across the globe are, are, are positioned. And the most important point is that all this uh, you know, scientific racism had a very, very uh, open and a very blatant claim that the Caucasian uh, race or the, or the whites or the Europeans, they were the most uh, you know, superior race to anybody else. And we have seen its consequence in the Holocaust, we have seen its consequence that in, in, in the rise of Nazism uh, in, in Germany and uh, maybe now currently you see the coming back of such kind of uh, uh, arguments, the, the rise of neo-Nazis, the kind of uh, you know racist uh, uh, uprising across the globe. Even now, uh, especially when, when science has convincingly proved that there are, there is, there is no pure race anymore. Every, every population, every individual in this whole world is a product of a lot of intermixing of different races. Uh, the racial purity is a myth. It, it no longer has any scientific, biological or historical or sociological backing. But during his time, he played a very important role in, 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 in propounding this argument that only the fittest need to survive. So uh, the when the evolutionary paradigm collapsed and fell into obscurity uh, in the 1930s, so did Spencer's sociology. So if you look at the larger transformation of uh, uh, Spencer's theory, there is a consensus among sociologists that his popularity, his influence uh, faced serious challenge immediately after 1930s because 
even now he is considered as a sociologist who gave certain kind of legitimacy uh, to this argument of uh, social Darwinism, who was heavily influenced by the biological uh, uh, influence on uh, social sciences, especially the a kind of a mechanical adoption of the, of the logic of evolution into that of uh, society. So uh, we will wind up the class now and we will meet in the next class. Thank you.